But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. From the footnotes of dusty books to the crossroads of pivotal moments, history isn't just a sequence of dates and names, it's a dance of context, circumstance, and consequence. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast. Today, we venture into the corridors of Renaissance Italy, where intrigue and power played out in the shadowy halls of city-states. We delve into the mind of a man whose name often conjures notions of cunning and strategy, the enigmatic Niccolo Machiavelli. Often misunderstood and sometimes vilified, but undeniably influential. Through his seminal work, The Prince, Machiavelli didn't just pen a guide for rulers. He cast a mirror onto the very nature of power and leadership. Prepare to dissect the pros, ponder the implications, and immerse yourself in a time when politics was as much an art as it was a game of survival. This is the History in Motion podcast. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast, where today we'll be talking about Niccolo Machiavelli, the great statesman, author, playwright, and political theorist of Renaissance Florence and Renaissance Italy. So I know, Richie, we talked a lot last time about Lorenzo de' Medici and the, and the Renaissance period of Italy. And I think we just started mentioning all of these great people that he rubbed shoulders with. Yeah. You know, we had Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, all these great artists. But we also mentioned Niccolo Machiavelli, and we kind of came away from that saying, you know, we probably should have touched on Machiavelli a little bit more last episode. And then as we discussed more, I think we realized he really deserves his own episode. And I think the one thing that's super interesting about him is this is the first time I think we've picked someone who's not necessarily a leader in the traditional sense. He's not a king. He's not an emperor. He's not a queen. He's not even an overseer of large projects, which we've seen with a few scientists that we've looked at. But he's really a great political theorist who writes about leadership and, and how to be a leader. So I think this will be an interesting kind of maybe different pivot point for us to to look at this specific person. But, you know, if we look at someone who's had an influence on leadership throughout all of history, I don't think you can go get much better than Machiavelli. No, I think you summed it up really well. Um, and it was interesting. Like, I think when we ju- when we initially picked him and the prince as the focal point of this episode, I don't necessarily think we were clear cut on the idea of this kind of leadership analysis that he's doing. So I think, you know, as a podcast that focuses on, you know, historical leaders and decision making, this is really well deserving of its own episode because it, it really does provide not only the historical context of leadership, but also kind of jumps into the modern day practice of, of politics. You know, this is still a book that I don't know if it's still in political science classes, but it was when I was in university. So it, it goes to show you that there is still a lot of relevance in what Machiavelli is describing in The Prince. Yeah, you can't really look away from the legacy of, of his writings um, because I think, yeah, they like you said, they're still being taught today and they're still being reviewed by leaders and people aspiring leaders today. And so I think when we look at the decision itself today, we're really going to look at his decision to write The Prince. So The Prince being his most famous work, which really looks at recommendations and a bit of a historical analysis on how to be a great leader, but also not so much just how to be a great leader, but how to maintain your governorship, your leadership over your uh, your subjects or your, your city state would be probably the better term that he was definitely seeing around his time, because that's kind of what Italy was all about. And I think... The most interesting thing with what he wrote was he kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit on what people would kind of talk about in back rooms. They would say, hey, like, you know, we're going to come out and we're going to say all these wonderful things. But really, behind closed doors, we're really going to deal with things our way to make sure that we consolidate our leadership and make sure that we stay in power. And one of the things that Machiavelli does is he writes this all down. And that's a very interesting decision because he's the first to really do so. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, changes everything when it comes to how leaders are looking at the way they rule and he becomes a household name within maybe 20 to 30 years after his death all across Europe. As we talked about last week, the printing press is in full force now. Exactly. People are starting yep. to translate books. It was, again, 
definitely happened at the right time, but definitely you can't take away from the quality of the work that he put out. Well, I think it goes uh, to two of the bigger concepts in the book, right? When you're talking about the right time and the right place, you know, fortune definitely favored him in some regard based on, you know, the point in history in which he's writing and the availability of the the printing press, as well as kind of the virtuousness that he kind of puts forward as well to actually, you know, kind of pull back the curtain and discuss these topics of leadership in the context of what he's seeing. And I think it's it's interesting because it's applicable not only to the Italian city states, but, you know, to a broader audience that's also kind of might be dealing with similar political issues of fragmentation across Europe at the time. Yeah, it's definitely a people problem and a human problem that he just happens to capture within the umbrella of Renaissance Italy. And I think yep. maybe that's a good transition for us as we talked last week at length about the Renaissance and really what it means. So if you definitely want to get a more in-depth um, picture of the Renaissance, definitely give last week's episode a listen before we before you continue on. But if you haven't had a chance to listen to it or you want a quick recap, I think, Richie, we should maybe do a, a few minute overview on what the Renaissance really is and why it's so transformative to this period in time. Yeah, I'll try my best to, to put a bit of a time cap on it. So if we're thinking about the Renaissance very, very broadly, and we're talking specifically about the Italian Renaissance, it's it's really a period of this kind of cultural rebirth and renewed interest in the arts, sciences, humanities. And again, it's primarily based in Italy, and it spanned roughly from the 14th century to the 17th century. Um, and I think we need to pinpoint specifically in Florence, it's kind of the epicenter of the Renaissance. And it, it is this period of intense cultural and intellectual activity that really revived the ideals of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Um, so it's kind of, you know, this idea of rebirth or Renaissance of this kind of classical learning and values that laid the groundwork for many of the advancements that we associate with the Renaissance, like, like in art, architecture, literature, and science. And some of the key pillars at a, at a very high level, you know, humanism being one of the main components or pillars of the Renaissance is this idea of having its roots in classical antiquity. So again, it goes back to the revival of this interest in the humanities that was inspired by the classical texts of antiquity. These humanists, they recovered and studied ancient manuscripts that had been lost or kind of forgotten during the Middle Ages. And they had this kind of reverence for classical texts that was, it wasn't merely just academic. It was rooted in the belief that the ancients had kind of attained a level of wisdom and knowledge that had since been neglected. And this led to, you know, a series of educational reforms. Uh, the humanist approach to education, essentially, which emphasized subjects like rhetoric, poetry, history, and moral philosophy. A couple of more, I guess, social implications of this is the idea of, this in, of individual agency and potential. So central to this kind of humanist ideal that permeated the Renaissance was the idea for of an individual's capacity for self-improvement and self-determination, something that we'll see in the prints a lot in a lot of his, in Machiavelli's writings. This was in direct contrast to the medieval worldview that often saw individuals as kind of passive players in this divinely ordained cosmic drama. Humanists believed that individuals could actively shape their destinies, which really is a stark contrast to, you know, what the previous centuries had kind of foretold. And the emphasis on individual agency was reflected not only in art, but in literature. And, you know, for portraits, for instance, captured kind of these distinct personalities and emotions of their subject. And there was really a celebration of like this kind of uniqueness of the individual. And again, kind of uh, in, in, in direct contrast to the medieval ages or the, you know, the medieval period, secularism is quite... I don't want to say it is essentially a totally secularist movement because, you know, the church still plays a very, very, very critical role in this period in history. But, you know, there is a distinct shift towards otherworldly and secular concerns. You know, humanists believe that it was not only permissible, but also praiseworthy to kind of seek fulfillment and happiness in this life rather than just wait for the afterlife. They did not reject religion, though, but they argued for a balance between earthly pleasures and spiritual obligations. So again, there's kind of very unique dance and nuance between the two. And maybe if we could just double down a bit on these classical texts that I had mentioned earlier. So we're talking about the works of Greek scholars that made their way into Italy. So there's classical philosophy and thought. So the works of Plato, they were reintroduced to the West. Um, you know, there was the Platonic Academy in Florence, which was sponsored by the Medici, and they became centers of discussion for Platonic
Platonic and other classical texts, also texts from uh, Cicero and Aristotle, really did play a huge part in reshaping intellectual discourse. And I think the biggest one for me, I think I mentioned it in the last episode, that really kind of, I think, stayed with me after studying the Renaissance, were the civic and social implications that kind of arose across the populace. So this admiration for classical antiquity was not just limited to art and literature, which is what we typically talk about, but the Roman concepts of republicanism, civic virtue, public service, you know, again, topics that permeate all of the prints really influenced political thought, especially in the city states of Italy. You know, this idea of the Renaissance man or a universal man, a, a person who is skilled in multiple fields became a bit of an ideal. So in essence, you know, if we're looking back, the Renaissance was not merely this kind of nostalgic look back and back into the past, but it was this you know, very vibrant and dynamic process of reinterpreting and reinventing those classics, where the wisdom of the ancients was kind of harnessed to forge a new culture and into an intellectual landscape for all of Europe. I think when you talk there about looking back at the ancients, you really see that in Machiavelli's writing. As we get into the prince, we'll see that. And he's really born into this world. Like this isn't, I wouldn't say he's born into this world as it's coming to fruition. It's deeply embedded. The Renaissance has been going on for decades at this point. And Florence is now this epicenter of culture and all of the things that you mentioned in this humanist mentality. He's, you know, he's trained in that. He's learned, he's growing up in that society. And so mm -hmm. we'll start to see how this kind of comes into Machiavelli's life. But it's interesting. I was reading something about him and one of the author made a great point. They said, if you read a lot of Machiavelli's writings, he's living through this unbelievable time in history. And as a student of history, he would know how special of a time this is. But he doesn't really seem to have that much interest in what's going on other than, <laughs> you know, the people building great statues and buildings. He doesn't really seem very interested in that. He's more interested in, I guess, the art of statecraft, meaning how different people are working behind the scenes or moving politically to make their state bigger, consolidate their power. He doesn't really have too much interest in all the wonderful things that the Renaissance has, but he does also have that love for the Republic idea or Republicanism. So you look at, you know, how Rome was a Republic, Florence was a Republic, then wasn't, then came, became a Republic again. And he's kind of involved in all of that. And we'll see why that's kind of important to him. So he may not necessarily write and talk about how great the Renaissance is, but he's definitely living a lot of those ideals and is essentially becomes a, a core piece of everything that the Renaissance stands for. Well, it's interesting, like reading the, having read the prints and having reread the prints, that particular point you just made really stuck out to me this time around. I didn't necessarily capture that when I first read it many years ago. But yeah, he doesn't seem all too interested in, in the same way we do. We're glowing talking about the Renaissance. He seems kind of disconnected from really interesting period of, you know, cultural explosion that's happening around him. He's more interested in the politics, the the rhetoric of politics and what's going on and, you know, republicanism more so than the cultural revolution that's happening around him. Yeah, I guess he knows what he likes and he doubles down on it, which yeah, I guess <laughs> you can't fault a guy for it. But yeah, it is just a kind of an odd thing. And I guess maybe sometimes when you're living through a day to day, it doesn't really stick out as, as something as special, you know, as we see it today. But I think let, we need to get into his life. But before we do that, we're going to do a quick recap on or kind of bridge the gap between where our last episode ended off with Lorenzo de' Medici's death in 1492 and up to the point where Machiavelli's, I would say, coming of age and political career and writings really begin. So Lorenzo de' Medici dies in 1492 and his son Piero essentially takes reins of the government. And we mentioned last week his son. So Lorenzo is Lorenzo the Magnificent, il Magnifico, and his son is Piero the Unfortunate. So why is he so unfortunate? So two years after Lorenzo dies, King Charles VIII of France invades Italy and enters Tuscany on his way to claim the throne of uh, Napoli. And so essentially, as he's moving through Tuscany, Piero rides out because he's essentially the de facto leader of Florence, just like his father was, and discusses a treaty with Charles of France. But it was said to be a very submissive treaty, a very weak treaty. He just gave the French a lot of concessions. And so the Florentines responded by forcing him into exile. So basically kicking out the Medici out, out of the city, which essentially ended this rule of the Medici that had been in place for over 100 years, going back to Cosmo de' Medici, Lorenzo's great grandfather, sorry, grandfather, and really restored this Republican government, which we kind of talked about this Republican ideal that is coming back through the Renaissance is now back in Florence. But something interesting happens, and I kind of alluded to it last episode a little bit, you have this explosion of art and culture and free expression and humanism and really individual agency and those sort of things. Sometimes, though, when things we'll see it in history get pushed too far in one direction, 
<laughs> to pull things back to the middle, you take someone kind of going hard line to the other side. And so during the time between the Medici being kicked out and I guess it's like a four, I think it's a four year period, a Dominican friar named Savonarola essentially kind of takes over the influence of Florence. And he's kind of like this mad prophet who's <laughs> shouting from rooftops saying, repent, repent, going after the Pope and saying that the Pope is corrupt, the church is corrupt, um, you must repent and and do, you know, almost back to this very Middle Ages type of religiosity where, you know, it's repent and think back to, you know, the the core teachings of the Bible and those sort of things. He's dressed down, for example, dressed like a monk. He's not dressed up in all this gold and riches. So he's kind of pushing back against the establishment of, you know, the very rich and powerful. Now, Machiavelli actually talks about Savonarola and the prince, and he calls him an unarmed prophet. And he says, unarmed, unarmed prophets will never win because when the chips are down and it gets violence and you don't have an army, it doesn't work <laughs> out very well for you. And that's exactly what happens to Savonarola. So um, through some exterior support outside of Florence, he loses support and is uh, hung in 1498 in Florence. So his reign only lasts about four years, but the Republic still stands mm -hmm. and continues on until 1512 when the Medici returned to Florence. But in that time, this is when Niccolo Machiavelli is on the scene and actually gets his opportunity to step into the ring and, and really s stamp himself on the political comings and goings of the Florentine government. It's interesting, the the mad prophet sentiment across history, right? Like even in an era where the church's power is probably unmatched, there is still someone with more zealotry in their heart <laughs> than yep. the powers that be to kind of disavow the church as it stands today. And I think even, you know, we kind of touched on it in our last episode, but there is this kind of interplay that is happening between powerful families of Europe and the papacy. And I believe it was it Lorenzo's grandson that ended up becoming a pope. I think there's two of them. I think his grandson and I think it was um, his nephew, I believe, um, Giuliano's, I think it was like illegitimate son or something like that. I don't remember the exact details, but there was multiple Medici popes that yeah, come to so power it, within the 1500s. Coincidence? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and I think it's an interesting time too, because if you look at, you know, Martin Luther is going to show up on the scene not too long from now and really, and you can start to see the the fracturing of the church just starting to begin with Savonarola and even mm -hmm. uh, Loren or Niccolo Machiavelli's writings. And you can start to see people are starting to look at how the papacy is essentially, it's weird because it's supposed to be the vicar of Christ on earth, they call it, this overseer of all of Catholicism on earth. Yet this become a, a kingdom, a state. It's invading and, you know, has an army and is doing all these sort of things. It's just kind of a weird kind of juxtaposition that comes together and it starts to fracture, um, you know, as a result. But there's, <laughs> I think there's a bunch of characters there and players that we would definitely need to talk about more. And I think even Savonarola would be an interesting one to to return to one day. But let's let's bring the man of the hour onto the scene. So Niccolo Machiavelli, he's born into a wealthy and prominent family. However, he was born at a low point in the family's history. So his father's a trained lawyer, but was barred from public office in Florence because he owed debt to the Florentine government. So at the time, the Florentine government had a, a rule where if you were in debt to the government, you couldn't hold public office. And so his father, Bernardo, kind of lived frugally administering his small property near the city with you know, a small income where he was kind of using his practice in a way, but not officially, maybe behind closed doors a little bit, just because he had this debt that he paid to needed to pay to the city that kind of barred him from a lot of the things he wanted to do. However, his father, much like his son, loved to read and had a very large library that Niccolo spent a lot of time in. So we don't know much about Niccolo's, you know, formal education, but we do know that he was living obviously at this time of, you know, philosophy and art and all of these sort of things. Yep. He's able to attend lectures throughout the city, you know, rub shoulders with these great, great people. Like we talked about last time, Florence is only a city of about 45 to 50,000 people. It's not very big. Yeah, yeah. And so when you have, you know, the greatness per 100,000 people is probably the highest it's ever been and will ever be in, in a city. So he learns Latin, he learns Greek, he learns these sort of things. He gets into this typical humanist education and really kind of grows himself into what a typical Florentine man would be during this time period. Well, it's interesting too, right? I think it was um, the BBC History podcast episode that was talking about the Prince and Machiavelli. And I believe it was one of the historians on it. It was talking about just proximity and Florence in relation to just how available these texts have become. And the Medici 
had actually opened up what what she referred to as the first public library. So the library of Medici, where they would actually aggregate and curate texts, you know, these great classical texts that everyone is reading. It's impacting education, it's impacting the culture, where you could go borrow books and return them, you know, uh, I'm assuming for a small free or, or for free. But this is the kind of, you know, the proximity and access that someone like Machiavelli could have to be able to if he didn't have much of an education, could, through his own virtue and self-determination, really educate himself because there was so much accessibility to these great works. Definitely. And I think we look at people moving into cities throughout history. There's definitely a correlation between the explosion of knowledge and the proximity of people to each other. Now, mm -hmm. it has its downsides when plague or disease comes in. It sure. you know, brings things down. But we look at the Renaissance, we look at the Enlightenment, we look at today, look at some of the big cities all around the world and all the great things that come out of some of those cities. And so, yeah, I think you can't take away from that. And then it goes back to, I think, the Medici and their patronage for the arts and yep. classical works and all those sort of things and making it available to the public as essentially propaganda in one sense, but also just feeling that it's their public duty to do so as well. And it serves them well for a time and not so well for another time, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think it all comes hand in hand. And again, luck and circumstance definitely play a factor in, in many people's lives. And, you know, two things here of him being born with the mind that he was born with and being in the, the area of the world that he was born in, you know, kind of works out for pretty sure. well for him. So when Machiavelli is ready to kind of start getting into the political sphere, um, like we mentioned, the Medici have been essentially kicked out of Florence. Machiavelli's in and around the political sphere, but Savonarola's, I guess, supporters are a little bit weary of uh, Machiavelli just because he has been a little bit outspoken about Savonarola and his ways. Um, mm -hmm. So when Savonarola is hung and then his body is eventually burned in the public square, a few days later, Machiavelli becomes the head of the Second Chancery, which is a post that placed him in charge of the Republic's foreign affairs in its subject territories. And he served here for about 14 years. So this was a position that oh. a lot of people would serve for life. It was a, you know, this was something, a position that wasn't so much dictating laws or passing legislation. It was more, you know, going to a different state, discussing a bunch of different foreign affairs with um, different kings and dukes and governments, and then trying to negotiate on behalf of the government. But the government would still have ultimate power. So one of his first actions that he did was he convinced the Florentine government to reduce its reliance on mercenary forces by starting a citizen militia. So if you look at this time period, pretty much all the city-states are hiring mercenaries to do their dirty work for them or yep. using auxiliary forces such as the French or the Spanish to kind of do their dirty work for them. And Machiavelli talks about this in The Prince saying, there's three ways to run to have an army. You have mercenaries, you have auxiliaries, or you have your own people. And he says the first two, the auxiliaries and the mercenaries, never work because the mercenaries are just getting paid. So when exactly. the chips are down, they're yeah. just going to leave. Yeah. Um, auxiliary forces can be pulled out from under the rug at any time because the king of France may say, well, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't see any value to this. But your own forces are going to fight for you. They're going to die for you. There's actual purpose to what they're doing. And so he kind of practices what he preaches here. And so he helps Florence kind of start their own citizen militia. Then he undertakes a ton of diplomatic and military missions all over Europe. So he goes to the court of France. He goes to Cesare Borgia, whose father was the Pope. Um, but Cesare was kind of leading the Pope's uh, military forces at the time, moving into different parts of Italy. He went to the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, and he went to the state of Pisa, to try and you know do a ver variety of different missions that would help the Florentine government. So all of these experiences, are, it's actually quite interesting, are all featured in The Prince. For example, he speaks out about Cesare, yep. talks about how he has this brutal justice approach to some mutinous captains in his army. And he kind of praises Cesare for it, saying it was a brutal thing to do to essentially kill these men. But if they're being mutinous... As a leader, you kind of have to do this. Yeah. So, so I think it's interesting to just kind of see he's taking little snippets of not only what he's reading and what he's seeing, but he knows these people because he's sat in rooms with them and spoken to them and actually seen how they conduct business. So we kind of get two sides of this where we see him looking at it from like the 10,000 foot view, but then also being in those boardrooms essentially and working things out with these different leaders. And he can understand how their minds work and really seeing that yeah, maybe he's brutal because he killed these people, but he can really see the type of person he is and what his goals are. So he 
he comments on, you know, like I was saying about Cesare, about how very smart he was and how he acquired land, but he criticized him for his inability to, to succeed without strong papal support. So it's just, it's an interesting thing where he's like, Cesare was super smart. He knew what he was doing, but he never was able to grow past leaning on his father's support as Pope. And then when Pope Alexander dies, the new Pope comes in, Cesare doesn't have a great relationship with him. And then everything kind of falls apart because he doesn't have the money of the Pope and the, and the pull of what the Pope would have um, previous to that. That's so interesting, right? Because I think even like having, like when I was reading The Prince, I'll, even though I don't think it's said explicitly, but there's this kind of sentiment that exists throughout his narrative, which is this idea, at least to me, and we could probably phrase it differently, but this idea of like legitimate authority and legitimate power. And I think his critique uh, of Borgia is probably kind of in that in that sphere, right? Like he was able to do a lot with the resources that he had, but he wasn't able to outgrow them and legitimize himself as a leader. Yeah, he talks about that a lot, eh? about how different people come up through different ways. Like he talks about yep. through luck or through war or through, yeah. I guess I'm doing air quotes, elections um, <laughs> when it comes to the papacy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very interesting kind of sentiment of how you get into power and how you can hold on to power. And yeah, it's just, yep. it's very interesting because he's seen how many examples within his lifetime where princes are coming up and then they're being knocked down almost seems like on a daily basis around Italy yep. because there's so many little city states. So yeah, it is very unique for him to be able to see all of this. So he does continue to do what he's doing. He he really does love his job from what we understand. He loves being, you know, behind the behind the curtain, speaking to these different people, working through the different alleys of government. But then something happens in 1512. The Florentine Republic is overthrown along with a lot of the leaders who are very supportive of Machiavelli. And this is the Medici returning to, to Florence. So the Medici come back in and they essentially assert their dominance with their de facto leadership back into the city like they did under Lorenzo and Piero. But unfortunately for Niccolo Machiavelli is he's suspected of conspiracy. So he's imprisoned, tortured, and then sent to exile um, outside of Florence. And so most historians think that this was just he got caught up in the the whirlwind of you know changing of power. And he was involved a lot with the previous government. Somebody may have pointed him out wrongly. And there's really no evidence to show that he was conspiring to do anything. Mm -hmm. Because I think one thing we know about Machiavelli is he's definitely ambitious, but I don't think he's ambitious to the point of wanting to be a king or to be a prince. He wants to be influential, but he doesn't necessarily want to overthrow the Medici. And we'll see yep. when he talks about when he writes the prince about actually dedicating that book to Lorenzo de Medici the second, not to be confused with Lorenzo the Magnificent. So this is Lorenzo's grand grandson who's come back to Florence almost tries to you know get back in in his good books. So unfortunately for Machiavelli is he's essentially kicked out of Florence. He's thankfully can stay close to the city though. He's living back in his father's farm, which is you know ten miles away from the city. So he's still within. You know, he still see the city. He can still interact with people close to the city, but you know he can never enter the city based on the rules of his um, his exile. So now Machiavelli has some time on his hands. He gets to sit down and he gets to figure out what he wants to do. And one of the most interesting, I don't know if I, at first I thought I was like, no, this is a little weird. But then I thought like, you know, for a guy like him, he's by himself. Maybe this makes sense is he writes in a letter to a friend that, you know, when his day ends, he puts on some nice clothes. He yeah. goes into his <laughs> study and he starts talking to these ancient scholars and historians and uh, philosophers. So he's talking to Cicero and, and almost having a, a mental conversation with him. Obviously, Cicero has been dead for 1500 years, but for him, it's a way, I think, to work out a lot of the thoughts that he has. It's a way to for him to almost kind of role play a little bit and work out a lot of these ideas. It is probably pretty wacky if you were just to walk it and Cicero is having an argument with Machiavelli, but it's Machiavelli kind of doing a, a Gollum Smeagol sort of thing and he's switching... Uh, switching voices or something like that. But this is kind of what his life has become. That He's this philosopher who's sitting there and spending a lot of time in thought and then eventually, you know, starting to sit down and, and write a few things. Yeah, it's interesting to, you know, the fall from grace he must be experiencing right now for someone who is in such an influential position. And, you know, again, to your point, based on what we heard and what we've read, he really loved his job. Like he, you know, I, I'm very envious of anyone with that much love for their occupation. So I can imagine that he's going through a lot of personal and inner turmoil, you know, at this period in his life. And 
is willing to do, you know, almost anything to get back into the space that he once occupied. And again, like leveraging that podcast that I think we both uh, at least took a, a, some listen to. Some of the historians on that podcast were kind of framing it as if this was almost his treaties or way back into his occupation, um, kind of like a, you know, a resume and a cover letter type approach to say, hey, like, you know, look at all of the intense thought I put into diplomacy and leadership. You know, I'm, I'm worthy of getting that role back and I have a lot to offer still. That's, yeah, that's exactly what it was. So that's what what the prince really was in that sense was I saw someone frame it in, in a way where they said, you know, when you see a, when you go to visit a great leader or a great king or a great emperor, you usually bring something of yours that you're very proud of. You may bring gold, you may bring a, a sacred artifact, or you, you do something to essentially flatter this king or queen or emperor. You show something that, look, this is what I can offer to you. Machiavelli takes that approach, but he says, my knowledge is that, is that answer. Yeah. And so when he writes The Prince, he dedicates it to Lorenzo de' Medici II by saying, this is what I can offer you. This is my advice to you. And I'm not really going to hold back in any way. I'm just going to tell you that this is the way things work. Do with it what you will. So he does write The Prince, and it's really this breakdown of all of these historical examples, but then also all these examples on how to lead. And so we'll get into like the details in, in a bit, but it's important to just understand that he's essentially saying, if I were a prince or if I were in your shoes, Lorenzo, here's all the things I would consider and here's my advice to you. So he yep. doesn't publish the book right away. It's actually not published till after his death, but there it is circulating throughout Florence. So people are reading it. There's different manuscripts being thrown around that, that people are starting to read. So people are definitely aware of what he's able to do. He also writes something called The Discourses on Livy, which is another book that is really looking at the histories of, of Rome specifically in different parts of um, that period in time. But the funny thing is we look at him today as this great political writer, but during the time, the common people wouldn't have really known him as a political writer. No. They actually knew him as a playwright, which I thought yeah. was super interesting. He wrote a bunch of political comedies, one called Mandragola, which means mandrake. And so some scholars read the play as an overt critique on the House of Medici and just kind of how they lead. <laughs> but we got to think about, right, like this guy has, he's clearly, he must have been going through some series of depression based on everything that was going on. His A, he's been tortured, which is never a good sign. Never, sure. you know, your yeah. physical health and mental health are definitely correlated. And now he's essentially banished from the city that he loves and really doesn't know where his life is going to take him. And so he turns to comedy, something to, you know, make himself feel a bit better and, and write and do some of the things that he really loves, which I think is, is kind of interesting because we see this darker side in The Prince where it's very just, not that emotion's completitely taken out of it, but it's not really a prominent feature where oh, in his yeah, definitely thing, yeah. not. It's like the, the, like the, remember, like the term Machiavellian, right? Still is something that's used today. And we'll get into kind of, I, I'm curious to your thoughts as we move forward on the book. But yeah, this kind of ruthless tactician and strategy that he is kind of calling for. I kind of like it, to be honest with you. But yeah, it is, it is totally devoid of emotion. <laughs> yeah, I think we should definitely get into that. I think we've we've kind of teased it enough. But let's just kind of wrap up the last few years of, of Machiavelli's life. And then we'll get into the prince. So after some years in exile, he was actually employed by Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who hired him to actually be the official historian of Florence. So he's invited back to the city to do some of this work. Fortunately, he's not given his old job back, just because people are still a little weary about who he is. And he was associated with the last government. And he's very outspoken on his views that you know, it's harder to get back to his old position, but he's still involved with the government. So the government, especially this cardinal, is giving him little jobs to do. So he asked him to go to the city of Lucca and do an overview of their government and report back. He's doing an overview of the improvements to Florence's fortifications. So he's almost like a consultant in a sense, where he's got yep. this vast knowledge and, and all of these things where he's not really given much power, but people are using him for his knowledge. So it's definitely great to see that he gets back into the fold a little bit. But unfortunately... You know, he never really gets back to that position. And I think partially because he's writing plays that are hitting at the Medici a little bit. <laughs> and everyone knows that he really wants the Republic to come back. And he was never a big fan of the Medici controlled government. So I can I understand why they didn't give him his job sure, back. Yeah. But unfortunately for him, fortunately slash unfortunately, the Medici are actually exiled from Florence in fifteen twenty seven. But unfortunately Machiavelli is sick at the time and, and dies almost a month later. So he does get to die and see Florence as a republic, but unfortunately never really gets back into that true position that he really wanted. But again, he's not 
he didn't die, uh, you know, a sad old man out in the countryside dreaming of the days when, you know, he was an important man. He was still able to get back into the government, do some of the things he loved, not to the level he wanted, but nonetheless, he's back in the fold. Yeah, it's very interesting here his bio because I've only known of Machiavelli through the prince and that was pretty much the only real avenue of analysis that i had i wasn't very familiar with his biography i would and i think we both kind of went in with like are we going to have enough content <laughs> to actually do it justice to talk about him but he lived quite an interesting life absolutely yeah he's i think just the fact that he's rubbing shoulders with all these great people of the time mm -hmm. and then he's writing it down and talking about almost giving like a little bit of review of a review on their ability to govern which I think is super cool. You really just don't see that. You don't see no. pretty much any leader sit down and say, well, here's what I thought about this person. Here's what I thought about that person. It's not something that you, you really see. So I think now's a good time to transition into the prince sure. a little bit. And I think, Rich, yeah. I'll let you take take the lead on this one because you've run your second read of it. I just read it for the first time this week, but it really is a super fascinating read. The thing that stuck out to me is just how candid and open he is yes. about all these sort of things. And it's like, yeah. you're really saying... When you take over a town and you don't have any prior claim to it, that you should wipe it off the face of the earth and put a new town in its place. You're really saying that. And so I can get why people read this and they think of the term Machiavelli and Machiavellianism. But I think there's a lot more to it than yes. just kind of that surface yep. stuff. And I think, yeah, there's we're going to have a pretty interesting discussion on a lot of the different points that he talks about and how it kind of ties into you know a lot of the leaders that we've talked about in the previous episodes. Yeah, I think it's going to give a very interesting layer of analysis to kind of juxtapose Machiavelli, the prince, and the broader context of the people that we've talked about throughout our last uh, episodes as well. But like, maybe I'll just jump into a bit of a little bit more of the context at a high level, just to kind of frame the context of, you know, the period more specifically about the world that Machiavelli is kind of living in and things that we just need to be mindful of as we do this, as we do like the, the analysis of the narrative itself. So again, you know, we've talked about before, it's a fragmented Italy. So during his lifetime, you know, Italy is not a unified nation. It's a mosaic of city states, each with its own ruler and government. So you have states like Florence, Venice, Milan, the Papal States, Naples. And again, we touched on our last episode, but they are in constant conflict with one another, making the Italian peninsula a bit of a hotbed of political intrigue and warfare. There's all, you know, it, it never really seems settled at any point. Foreign invasions. And again, it's the fragmented nature of Italy at this point makes them extremely susceptible to foreign invasions. So that fragmentation makes them vulnerable to foreign powers. By the time Machiavelli is writing, Italy has experienced multiple invasions from France, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire. These foreign invasions and dominations greatly, you know, greatly affected the political autonomy of the Italian city-states, and it was a source of you know frustration and concern for thinkers like Machiavelli. This is an interesting point that I didn't necessarily think of, but I think is actually quite relevant: the decline of medieval chivalry. So this is pre this is pretty interesting. So the traditional chivalric code and knightly values were being replaced with more modern forms of warfare and statecraft. So you can see this in his pragmatism in The Prince, which kind of reflects this shift, emphasizing effective rule and power consolidation over a traditional honor code. And I think I think that really gets at a very unique point of this shift that is happening across the city states. And it's probably happening very subtly, you know, I don't maybe not a lot of people are realizing it, but I think because of Machiavelli's position, the circles he runs in, he's able to kind of see this bubbling up on the ground, which I think is a really unique kind of perspective, which I didn't necessarily, it would have been a bit more subtle, I think, but I, I think you can really see it in his narrative. I think too, I was just, as you were talking and thinking about, now you have this added layer of, I'm going to say free markets, but free enterprise really, yep. where these families are getting rich off banking and trade and all these other yep. things where two, 300 years ago, it was pretty much the king and the nobles that kind of had their businesses set in stone and everything was kind of through the government. And so honor, I think, was probably a bigger thing just because it was, there's a hereditary element that's a lot more important. Where today, it's yep. like you can still make your own way to an extent. There's obviously still, a, you know, you're not part of the nobility. It's it's tougher to, to move forward. But yeah, that's super fascinating. It's something I didn't really think about. And you really kind of, as we started to read, like we talked about Lorenzo last week, and there's no way 200 years ago that somebody or 200 years ago from Lorenzo's time, someone's going to get stabbed in a church 
and tried to get assassinated. Like there's that, you yeah. know, that, sh- that chivalry is just not there. It's just not something you would do. And yeah. I think, yeah, it's definitely a, a huge transition that's happening that is yeah, super fascinating that I didn't even think of. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that, and I think even more broadly speaking, if we kind of double click on that, to your point, you know, you have these old aristocratic families, you know, the nobility, and then you have the merchant class that is burgeoning at this time. So again, there's a con- there's that social and political tension amongst this landed nobility that's been there for generations. They might not be the most business or politically savvy in this new era, but now there there's contention between families like the the Medici, who you know are becoming very influential bankers across all of Europe. So yeah, and it, and it's it's happening in real time, and Machiavelli is able to kind of see this as it's bubbling up to the surface. And again, I guess just to kind of double down on some of the points that you made already. Paul, but you know, the rise and fall of the Florentine Republic. So he was a public servant during the Florentine Republic's existence. He witnessed the rise, the attempts at maintaining a republic, and the eventual return of the Medici family, which ironically left to his own downfall. Um, so obviously, he's deeply influenced by just you know the rise and fall of the Florentine Republic. And again, his personal experience. I don't think we can undermine his experience at all. You know, he was he was banished, he was exiled, he was tortured. Of course, it's going to have an impact on his writing and his biases in terms of how he's going to curate and craft his language as he's uh, putting forward the prince. And maybe before we get into the book, Paul, I'm I'm curious, maybe we spend like a minute or two just kind of talking through what our, uh, you know, reviews of it were. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts were kind of diving into it for the first time. I think for me, the one thing that I didn't really expect was the amount of historical examples he was going Mm -hmm. to give. Historical for us, for him more was things that were kind of happening and more of a political commentary maybe on some of those things. I think that was super interesting because he always had examples for, you know, hey, you shouldn't do this and here's someone who did it well and here's someone who didn't do it very well. I came into it thinking that it was going to be maybe a bit more darker and kind of sinister just based on my perception of when we look at Machiavellianism as a as a personality trait is almost kind of linked up with psychopathy and some of those and other parts of kind of the sure the darker sides of personality traits. Um, but yeah, I thought it was I thought it was very interesting. Sometimes a little bit too maybe to the point. There wasn't much nuance in some of the stuff. <laughs> like he was like, I think it was one thing where he said mercenaries are useless. Never use them. It's like, okay, well, probably right. But maybe there are some times where it makes sense. And I understand what he's getting at from the context that he's seen. Um, But yeah, I thought it was a very interesting kind of overview of everything that he did. But when I tried to kind of bring it to a modern context, a lot of the arguments do fail because there's a democratic system, for example, or you're not going to be able to really use it in business because you can't rush and destroy your enemies (laughs) in, in, you know, the rival company in the same way that Cesare Borgia can march in with an army or something like that. So yeah, I think there's some interesting things that kind of transgress to today, but then there's some things that just fall flat as soon as, you know, society changes over the, the centuries after. Yeah, no, I think you raised some really good points. I would say this, I, I would, I think my analysis would be very similar. I, I, I would also kind of have this modern critique that, you know, most people who use the word Machiavellian or Machiavellian, I think they put a little bit too much emphasis on how dark it is. I think those people probably haven't read The Prince, <laughs> but I think it, it's there's definitely a bit of dark, strategic, ruthless, you know, tactician type of thinking in The Prince. But I don't necessarily think it's evil. I think it can be dark because it, it does seem, you know, to our you know earlier point in the discussion kind of devoid of emotion, which, you know, I don't think he's really putting too much emphasis on because he's focused on, you know, leadership and consolidating power. He doesn't really leave a lot of room in his analysis for being an emotional leader, because I think ultimately he sees it as a detriment. And he's applying for a job too, right? And I don't think anybody in their resume says, you know, hey, I did this at this company, but, you know, I I didn't feel great about doing it, but I did it anyways, (laughs) right? It's just straight to the point. This is what needs to be done. So I think if we look at it from that context, um, it's super interesting. But something you brought up about kind of the the tactile pieces to what he was writing about, I actually was reading a little bit on Machiavellianism, this personality trait. When people take tests to kind of see where they fall on certain levels with different personality traits, one of the things they look at Machiavellianism is two things. One is your thoughts. You know, do you think you should do, like, I think one of the questions was, do you think you should get ahead at the expense of others, for example? And then there's sure. also yeah. the thought, but there's also the tactile thing. It's like, would you actively do this? And a lot of times you'll see people be like, yeah, I think I would do it. And then when they get into a situation, they actually don't go and do it. And so I think with Machiavelli, we can kind of see a lot of this stuff is in his head. Would 
he be able to go and wipe out a town and kill 20,000 people because that's what he wrote down? I don't think we we would know that answer. He recommends that you should do it. Doesn't necessarily mean he's going to do it. So I think there's a little bit of a, an idea of, you know, you can write things down, but to actually go and act them out, totally different thing. Well, I think, yeah, so you, you beat me to it. But yeah, this whole idea, which I think is has been popularized in modern culture, but really can be traced back to even probably before Machiavelli, does the end justify the means, right? This whole sentiment, um, which is very often associated with them. But like, again, I think reading The Prince, it really does emphasize the importance of kind of, you know, real politic, like this focus on practical, pragmatic, and logical governance, which is weighted, you know, more heavily than any kind of moral or ideological consideration you know i think he makes that blatantly obvious from the get-go that he is not very much concerned with morality or ideology but his focus is on you know effective governance as a whole and obviously that's kind of what makes it controversial and has obviously made the prince this kind of foundational text in political theory and i guess yeah i guess that kind of does get to the heart of it right like he argues that rulers sometimes must undertake morally questionable actions to achieve their goals especially when it comes to the stability of their rule or the safety of their state. And he posits this kind of idea that a ruler's primary objective should be to maintain power and ensure the stability and security of their domain, even if this requires actions that might be deemed immoral or unethical. And I think if I was going to sum up the prince, you know, as a narrative, I would probably use that line or those few lines right there, because I think it really does get to the heart of what he's saying. But he does have a couple of other kind of key ideas that I think that permeate the entire book. Um, some of them relevant, some of them not so relevant, because obviously this is a book that was written 500 years ago. But this idea of like princes and principalities, you know, he begins by categorizing principalities, so territories that are ruled by a prince as hereditary, new, or mixed. He also kind of differentiates between monarchies and republics. This idea of acquiring new principalities, so he discusses various ways a prince can acquire new territories from either inheritance or to outright conquest. He does focus a lot on military. I know we've talked about it a bit here, but you know, a successful prince, according to Machiavelli, should prioritize a strong military. He should be well-versed in the art of war and rely on his own troops rather than mercenaries. There's the concepts of virtue and fortuna. So he introduces these concepts of virtue, which is a combination of strength, skill, and strategic prowess, and fortuna, so luck or fortune. And this kind of interplay that happens um, in, some, in, in one's life. So you could be lucky to find yourself in a situation that, you know, you're in the proximity of people who provide power or resources, but it is your virtue, you know, your combination of strength, skill and strategic prowess that will enable you to take advantage of the luck and fortune that has been bestowed on you. So it, it's, it's really interesting to kind of frame it that way, right? And you're seeing these sentiments of the Renaissance of like self-determination and individual, you know, willpower to be able to kind of you know, work through things on your own and have that ability to create and, you know, serve. It's interesting that he doesn't really go towards the religious element at all. Like he doesn't no, say something. Yeah. I was surprised. I was waiting for, he mentions, you know, religion and kind of mentions God kind of passingly a couple of times, but it's very minor. And in that sense of, you were saying having that luck, but also having those virtuous qualities and when they come together, great things can happen. But he didn't say like, oh, and have the blessing of God or anything like that, or making sure you have good favor. You know, you're going to church on Sunday and making sure that you're in God's good graces, which kind of now that you just said it is something that's kind of really hit me is he doesn't really talk about religion. And it's just no, so weird doesn't. to me because that time period is it's so, so important. But then it kind of comes back to what you were saying a little bit more about this is the Renaissance and this individualism is starting to come forward. And it just seems kind of like a breakaway from a lot of those religious elements to more of a secular element. And I yeah, just, no, 100%. yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. I'm just it's confused to hear a little bit. Yeah. I'm trying to rationalize yeah. it in yeah. my head of like why he would skip over it. But I think, I think you summed it up really well with how you kind of described the Renaissance. I would posit a theory that since he is advocating for effective governance over ideology and morality, he would probably feel like if you can justify your ideology to win the hearts and minds of your of your citizenry, go for it. But let's not over vector on it, which seems to be, you know, I think would be in line with his thinking and approach. Absolutely. I think that's a great theory because he can't. Ex this is the one thing you probably can't explicitly write down is, hey, use the church for your own gain, even if you don't believe in it. Nailed it. Yep, yeah, yep, that's yep, it. Exactly. Exactly. That's such a great point, because, yeah. yeah, like it's exactly what he would say is like he talks about those things like lie to people straight to their face 
Yes. But if just because like if it's going to risk your leadership ability, your ability to stay in power, why would you stay true to your word? That's so silly. Why would anybody do that? Exactly. He, yeah. It's so interesting. And I think this kind of gets to my next point, which is his qualities of leadership, right? And this is something that we are obviously very interested in. You know, we have a podcast kind of dedicated to historical leadership. So for him, you know, while it's beneficial for a prince to be loved, it's more important to be respected and if necessary, feared. And I think this is one of the key takeaways that stuck with me for the first time I read The Prince. Because it's very unique. That's not something that you usually say out loud <laughs> to people or, you know, budding leaders. You know, a prince should strive to avoid being hated, but he shouldn't be too concerned with appearing virtuous. He's got to act in the best interests of the state, even if it requires deceit or cruel. It just kind of goes against your moral compass kind of ticks and goes, you can't, you know, you can't do that. You can't, you can't kill a bunch of people as a result to just maintain your power. And it's something I think that we will have a very modern sense of, and even probably back then they had that sense of it. But again, his goal is how do you stay in power? And I think the thing too, is when we even look at it from a modern sense as well is how do you stay in power as prime minister or president? Oh, you lose an election, you move on with your life, you do something else. It's unfortunate, but you're not dead. Your whole family hasn't been murdered. Exactly. That's, that's the stakes exactly. they're dealing with, right? Yeah, 100%. So if the stakes are, if you ask somebody, well, would you lie to someone's face to and backstab them to save your family and to make sure that you maintain your position in society and keep your family alive, make sure your children and grandchildren have a successful future? Maybe not a lot of people would say yes. But deep down, I bet you a lot of people would say absolutely they would go and do that. Well, this this is perfect, right? Like, again, a great segue. Uh, there's a lot of interesting symbolism in the prince. And the one that stuck out to me, I think we might have talked about it last week before we jumped in, was this kind of juxtaposition of the lion and the fox, right? You ask most leaders, most titans of industry, people that you see in positions of power, what symbol do you usually associate with them? Or what animal do you usually associate with them? It's usually the lion, right? That's the lion's raw strength, the leadership, this regality that we associated with it. But uh, Machiavelli does, he, he says something interesting, like you shouldn't necessarily underestimate how beneficial the cleverness of the slick fox can be. And that to me is a very, very interesting sentiment. Because, you know, in one way, you can emulate the fox and the princes to make promises, but you don't need to necessarily keep your promises or word all the time. To your point, you know, if obviously integrity is an important virtue for all leaders, because, you know, laws and contracts are the basis for state institutions. But just like the sly fox, you should know when to occasionally forget a principle in favor of your own self interest. I was doing some research and someone uh, like I think it was a Reddit post. It's like, Think about it this way. You know, if a, if a rebel leader is giving you trouble, why not invite him in for peace talks and then execute him swiftly? This would solve the problem like really well. Right. And I think this is this. That's a very Machiavellian thing to do. Yeah, it's this balance, right? Everything is, is a, I, think, I think that kind of goes throughout the book, right? It's just this balance of if you backstab a rebel who's got no other political ties or no other family to deal with, it's not going to hurt you. But exactly. if you invite the king of France over and somehow find a way to murder the king of France, Yeah, we have you're going to have all out war and it's not, and yeah. nobody's ever going to come to the, the table with you again. And so, yeah, he finds that kind of that balance. And it's like, you don't want to be that lion who's just rushing into battle all the time and, you know, punching yep. people in the face and coming with raw strength, but you don't want to be the person who backstabs someone nine times out of 10 because no one's going to trust you. And it's, yeah, this is this interesting balancing act. And then I like kind of the two animal analogies too, because you're right. We do think of, you know, this great strong leaders I and mean, the symbolism of a lion kind of comes to the, the forefront. Well, I but think that's why the that day, analysis yeah. is so interesting though, right? Like mm. we think of what we see as the lion, right? And rightfully so, because we don't get to see behind the curtain. Here we do. And, you know, I would assume most successful people are not the roaring lion 24-7 behind the scene. I would assume there is some element of being the clever or sly fox behind the scenes and being very calculated in their decision making. And I think that's why this this kind of comparison stuck out to me so much. Yeah, I think it's super fascinating. Even when you look at other leaders throughout history and you get to read some of their writing or you get to hear kind of behind the scenes. Like I saw this thing. It was it was conversations that Hitler was having with like his generals and stuff, but like mm -hmm. just in rooms. You know, we're used to the very, the lion of Hitler, I guess, very raw, raw in your face, sure. very loud animated speeches. But it's just him kind of speaking. And I wouldn't necessarily say it was scheming from a political sense, but, you know, they're talking about troop formations and strategy and po political affairs and domestic issues. And it's just this kind of more softer voice and just this 
everything's kind of brought down and he's just sitting there discussing matters of state and that yeah, line yeah, yeah, has yeah. definitely been caged and he then you know he brings it out when he needs to and so yeah i think you're right on that they're definitely not doing it all the time but they bring it out when they need to and then when they exactly. need to kind of go into the back room and you know scheme a little bit they're not going to come out and be like yes i am the sly fox who is gonna you exactly, know stab yeah, everybody yeah, in the yeah, back yeah. right yeah and i think that gets I, I think that's one of the coolest things about reading the prince is that he does a really good job of of discussing and analyzing this kind of duality of good leadership in his mind but he also gets into other topics which you know i think are also very crucial to kind of mention on as we kind of round off the hour here it's not just who you are as a leader but it's also who you surround yourself with so he dedicates you know quite a bit of text to advisors. So, you know, he advocates for princes surrounding themselves with trustworthy advisors and avoiding flatterers. So people that are just going to give you pats on the back that are undeserved, but some people that can hold you accountable and can actually provide you with strategic input and help you in your decision-making and calculus. He talks a lot about public perception. So obviously maintaining a good public image is vital. You know, PR is everything. But it's more important for a prince to have a flexible disposition in the eyes of Machiavelli, adapting to change and circumstances to secure his rule. And probably one of the more controversial topics in the book is the role of cruelty. Um, you know, sometimes he advocates a prince must be cruel, but this cruelty should be used judiciously and for the greater good. <laughs> it's often better to be swift and decisive in punitive actions to prevent further disorder or dissent, which I think is a very hot take. <laughs> I don't know how well it would play in the modern era, but I do think there is a sentiment in this if we look at it, obviously, from the historical context. If you don't punish a group of people who have organized and executed a failed rebellion against you, who is, you know, who are you to assume that the next group of rebellers isn't in the in the shadows lurking and waiting because they don't believe that you have you know the strength or the authority to actually punish them i think it's as dark as it is if we look at a lot of like you were just saying like a lot of historical figures and leaders the ones that do the bloodshed early and do it aggressively typically seem to last longer than the ones that are slowly chopping heads off as they go along like i think of augustus caesar is a perfect example yes when he yeah. takes over after years of civil war he murders a lot of people like a lot like anybody who was in his way anybody who he thought was a threat they had these massive purges and were killing thousands and thousands of people but then that starts off the pax romana the roman peace where rome prospers for so long and he's not going around cutting off senators heads like you know someone like commodus would be doing where we all know how it ends with him, right? And it's just this slow burn of continuous not being able to get rid of their enemies. And there's a bunch of other reasons that he kind of mentions. And I think he even mentioned Machiavelli and the Prince about confiscating property and how it's yep. kind of easy to do that, but it's, it's a lot harder to start cutting off heads. And so he basically said, like, be careful with confiscating property because once you start, it's a slippery slope and you're going to keep doing it. So yeah, I think it's it's something that's kind of worked throughout history. And then again, it's hard to put a modern stamp on it because, you know, no leader is going to come in and say, yeah, I got to kill 5,000 people to be able to consolidate my power. But back well, then, here's, someone here's else is going to do it, right? Though, right. We yeah. covered that. So I was thinking about this while you were talking and something came to mind. And obviously you'd have to, like, it doesn't fit the box perfectly. But if we look at someone like Truman, right, who dropped Very two true, yeah. atomic bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and arguably afflicted, you know, some of the worst cruelty we've ever seen in the modern era. But it was used judiciously and arguably, and I would I would argue for the greater good to put an end to World War II and stop the loss of life that was already happening. Yeah, we have to do that nasty human arithmetic, but you're right. Like, right? he made a decision and, you know, it's the slow burn sometimes I think kind of gets passed by when you start to see the number of people and the turmoil and all the other things that come out of it. It's like ripping a Band-Aid off. It's a horrible analogy for dropping a nuclear bomb versus yeah, is, not. But, yeah. but it really is. If you can deal with it up front, um, you know, you can kind of move on with things. But one thing I wanted to go back to as well, Richie, and we've just been trying to put a modern stamp on a lot of this is the one thing I think that really resonates today that you mentioned was discussion about advisors and bringing people around you that aren't going to flatter you, not bringing in a bunch of yes men. Like, yep. I think that's probably permeated throughout time and is probably even more relevant today, especially as like leaders yeah. are hiring people and you know, bringing yep. people into your government and all of those sort of things. Like, I'd be curious if in, I, I found that chapter a bit interesting because this is like a job resume for him. He's like, hey, advisors are great. You should, you should bring them in and make sure they're good ones. And I'm surprised I wasn't a footnote saying, you know, 
Um, if they're named Nicola Machiavelli, they're, they're especially good. <laughs> but I think that's another great point of just how important, you know, or not so much how important, but just how these ideas continue to move on throughout time. And I think yep. that was the one that I think you can put a modern stamp on and say, absolutely, there's no question about it. Surround yourself with people who are going to challenge you and are going to give you good advice and have your best interests at heart and, you know, aren't just going to be there and tap you on the shoulder and say, oh, yes, you're doing a great job. Keep doing what you're doing, even though they may think otherwise or they're not competent enough to know. Well, it's interesting, right? I think, you know, in, in, a, in the fashion of the Renaissance, as we've covered it now in, in two episodes, this is very much a text that I think continues to be a product that is, you know, reevaluated, you know, and reviewed, reanalyzed and rediscussed. And our interpretation of it continues to change. Um, I, when I was reading it, there was a part in the uh, foreword from the translator. And it was interesting to read in the and the translator section was quite lengthy, actually. But I read the whole thing because it's such an interesting sentiment about how translations change. This translation is the translation of an previous translation because words and concepts and ideas have changed quite substantially so how we communicate something from a previous translation might not hold as much water as it does today i think as we read through a work like this and people continue to read it because it still is like this kind of foundational text in political theory we have this opportunity to kind of reinterpret it and reevaluate it to see how if it is and or needs to be applicable in the modern era yeah, it'd be super interesting to see if someone who's a native Florent, Florentine Tuscan dialect of Italian speaker read, you know, the original copy of oh, uh, whatever. So cool. <laughs> I would be curious if they can even make heads or tails of it. Like if you go back to read, you know, Victorian yeah. English, just, you know, you read some of Shakespeare stuff and you're kind of rolling your eyes saying, what did he yes. just say there? Um, yes. So yeah, that would be super interesting to see. But yeah, you're right. As time moves on, this translation, I'm sure in 100 years, we'll have another translation because... You know, they may be referencing certain things that don't really exist anymore or words don't have the same meaning. So, yeah, it's I think that's super fascinating, especially, too, as you change languages as one word means something in a certain language, but doesn't that exact word doesn't exist in another language. And if that gets exactly. translated, it's yeah, it can be really, really interesting to see how much is diverted really from the original text and what he originally thought. Yeah. And, I, th you know, I think we've been able to kind of get to the core messages across you know, the prince and what he's kind of advocating for in terms of good leadership, you know, he kind of closes off with uh, this, this personal sentiment, you know, this, the importance of Italian unity in the final chapter, he makes like a very passionate plea for a strong ruler to unify Italy, to free it from foreign domination and to restore its pride. So again, like, you know, it's a, it, it goes back to one, this is very much a proposal to get his old job back. And you can see the the civic and the civic duty, the, the civil service nature of what he's trying to do and how much passion he feels for his state and, you know, the potentiality of unifying Italy with a strong leader. And I think like, there's a lot of sentiments of the Renaissance here. And obviously, because he's writing it at the time, but yeah, it's such a unique and interesting work that is relatively short read like it's it's not a very lengthy read at all um but yeah it, it is it is very powerful and you know he crams a lot into it and it makes for a fascinating time definitely it's super interesting it's super relevant and it gives you a great little history lesson too and i think at the end there yeah you can see the you maybe see the little bit of emotion come out in machiavelli that we don't get to see is he yep he sees the you know italy could get swallowed up by the french or the spanish or the ottomans at really at any point, because they're always infighting with each other, and it takes another almost 350, 400 years for Italy to actually unify. And, you know, I'd be curious if Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel were reading, you know, The Prince and were able to kind of read that last chapter and say, you know, hey, we did it. We did it for you, Niccolo. I think that would yeah. be a little kind of cool thing that I'd be very curious if those guys were kind of aware of what he wrote. And I'm sure they were based on you know, what was at stake for them. So yeah, I think this has been a super fascinating um, episode and a little bit of a, I guess, a deviation of what we usually do, but really kind of bringing it all back to historical leaders and, you know, being able to piggyback on a lot of the work kind of we did last week was nice. And just staying in the Renaissance is super interesting and it's going to be yeah. hard not to do, you know, we have a list of probably about 10 people that have come <laughs> out here from our, from our research. That would be super interesting to talk about at this time period, but yeah, I'm sure we'll return to the Renaissance uh, very soon, but yeah, we're definitely coming out of this with a big list of names of, of people we want to talk about. And I'm really happy we got to get to, to Machiavelli sooner rather than later. Yeah, it was a great episode. Awesome. Thanks, Richie. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you for listening to today's episode of the History in Motion podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through time, please subscribe, rate us, and share the podcast with friends. Your support helps keep history alive. Until next time.